Hello, my name is Gözde Göncebert. I'll be presenting our paper titled Therapeutic Touch, Reactive Clothing for Anxiety on behalf of my co-authors Tara Halstead, Wo Yu Zeng, Ching Ri Pan from UC Davis, representing Department of Design, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Department of Biomedical Engineering. Touch is fundamental in sensing the world and in human interaction. Effective touch is also a powerful force in human development throughout the whole lifespan. The emotional and physical health benefits that come by being touched in safe ways are well established. Research shows that therapeutic touch increases the activity in parasympathetic division and lowers the activity in the sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system, decreases the galvanic skin response, and promotes the production of calming neurotransmitters. Therapeutic touch has been used for conditions such as autism spectrum disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, sensory processing disorder, and dementia, as well as anxiety disorders, as a calming agent. World Health Organization estimates that people living with dementia worldwide is currently at 50 million and will almost triple by 2050. On the other hand, according to CDC statistics, the estimate autism prevalence increased to 1 in 54 children in 2020 from 1 in 100. 10 children in 10 years. Similarly, anxiety disorder statistics show that 3.4% of world's population, around 265 million people, suffer from anxiety disorders. In this context, design-based non-pharmacological interventions are increasingly recognized as having great potential to help. Smart clothing and textiles with tactile stimulation abilities especially can offer novel ways of complementing care to empower people with different conditions in everyday situations because of its ubiquitous nature and affordance. Wearables are body-mounted technology that can come in forms of accessories and clothing worn on the human body. A more specific subgroup of wearable technology Smart clothing can be distinguished from other worn accessories such as bracelets and watches. In this specific subgroup, electronic textiles become the building blocks of smart clothing, referring to fibers, yarns, or fabric with embedded electronic functions that offer flexibility that is not existing in traditional electronics. Smart clothing offers the comfort of everyday clothing with the potential to detect and react to a wide range of data about the wearer due to close proximity to the whole body as opposed to smart watches and wristbands which are limited in scope. Smart clothing and textiles have the potential to not only sense, monitor and collect data or in other words inputs which can be collected explicitly by user issuing a command or implicitly by using sensors to detect changes. Smart clothing can also act on the body with actuation capabilities or create outputs, in other words. And these outputs could be things like promoting mechanical, electrical, and thermal tactile stimuli. Thus far, the emphasis in design of wearables, including smart clothing, has been on inputs or sensing health and fitness data with comparatively little research on responsive output capabilities. It is important and significant to conduct research on reactive smart clothing that could respond to changes in vital signs of the body and potentially contribute to management of many different medical conditions. Textiles act as second skin to protect and nourish our bodies and therefore hold a strong potential to function as interfaces for therapeutic touch. Tight-fitting compression clothing, weighted vests and blankets 
have been utilized to provide relief in many medical conditions. With the development of technology that allows embedding electronics in textiles, it is possible to develop context-aware clothing that can react to arousal in multiple ways through tactile, textile actuators. Different fields including clothing and textile design, product design and human-computer interaction approach wearable product design with tactile stimulation capabilities from different perspectives. Researchers in HCI attempted to embed tactile stimulation through vibration, temperature change, pneumatic compression into accessories and clothing to act as a nonverbal, asynchronous communication tool. Interdisciplinary teams of researchers from design, textiles, and engineering developed wearable products with actuation capabilities targeting rehabilitation and healing. A wearable with sound output to aid elderly in rehabilitation exercise, a compression waist with shape memory alloy springs that contract on command when heated for children with autism spectrum disorder. Another study explored the tactile, textile surfaces incorporated in a pillow that can produce cause and effect upon touching through light and heat. Our study aims to determine the needs and preferences for wearable products that use textiles as an interface for therapeutic touch applied within health and well-being. We employ an ethnography method in public online communities to collect data on user and caregiver feedback about existing products that provide therapeutic touch and we review the interdisciplinary literature to collect data on feedback about prototypes developed in different fields. Ultimately, through identifying the design requirements for textile-based wearable products, we develop a user-friendly, reactive undershirt with embedded pneumatic textile actuators and electronic textile-based sensing capabilities that can react to change in heart rate variability to stimulate human contact and bring about the health benefits of affectionate touch during arousal. Products in the form of weighted vests and blankets, tight-fitting clothing, tactile toys and accessories for individuals with wide range of disorders are abundant. Therefore, there is a vast amount of data available in the internet which has not been systematically analyzed to understand the needs of users based on existing experiences with these traditional products. So with the goal to understand these needs of individuals who can benefit from tactile body actuation from multiple perspectives and to ground the design decisions for the reactive undershirt, we employed an ethnography method to analyze the online data. We conducted an exhaustive internet research using keywords such as compression therapy, compression clothing, deep touch pressure, sensory clothing, occupational therapy, dementia, Alzheimer, autism spectrum disorder, anxiety disorder, so on and so forth. Our search included both e-commerce websites, niche company websites, as well as public online forums in which caregivers and people with related disorders shared their coping mechanisms and recommendations about products. Based on these analyses, we documented the positive and negative feedback about tactile products for our target audience and developed a framework of design requirements to ground the development of the reactive undershirt for anxiety. And based on the design requirements, we developed ideas and prototypes for dynamic textile-based tactile actuators to provide compressive tactile sensation. Materials and fabrication methods to laminate textiles to design airtight bladders, which would function as the pneumatic soft actuators, were determined. Appropriate locations and sizes of these pneumatic soft actuators on the wearer's body were identified. E-textile-based heart rate variability sensors were integrated in the reactive undershirt at designated locations to detect the emotional state of the wearer. 
focusing on textile-based wearable products that provide compression therapy to calm and comfort the user with gentle compression, we identified three product categories as weighted, stretch, and inflatable products, which range from vests, jackets, to hats and shawls. The benefits of current products are that Many users find them effective in helping the wearer relax and calm down as they simulate a gentle hugging sensation. They are regarded as versatile and can be worn in many situations. As the calming effect can help the wearer stay quiet in appropriate situations, stay focused on work, sleep through the night and self-regulate from a meltdown. As depicted in this figure, positive and negative feedback we gathered are color-coded where blue designates location and amount of compression, red identifies useful conditions for compression, and green identifies product features such as material size, use experience, comfort, and style. Based on this, it's possible to conclude that compression therapy itself is evaluated positively. But the products that are designed to deliver this type of therapy by different means have flaws, and are evaluated negatively. Therefore, there is a need and opportunity for user-friendly and innovative design that can make change in people's lives. Departing from the analysis and coding of the feedback on existing products, we identified four design requirements, which we discuss in relation to findings from our in-depth internet research. The first one is location and amount of compression. They are important factors in effectiveness of the compression therapy, also in other aspects of the product comfort, such as mobility, thermal, and tactile properties. Products that distribute a gradual compression over the back and size of torso and the shoulders, avoiding body core area, were evaluated more positively. Product comfort is the second one. It's the critical design requirement as most of the negative feedback on available products were related to its features. Tactile and thermal comfort, mobility and sizing are the sub-requirements under this. Feedback we gather suggests that lack of breathability and restriction of movement are concerns because they can cause panic attacks and meltdowns. It's crucial that the garments can be worn in different weather conditions without causing individuals overheat. In addition, it was commonly reported that bulky seams in tight clothing rub uncomfortably against skin. And finally, finding the right size for compression to function was defined as another challenge. Third one is visual style, which refers to, the, to how compression clothing looks in comparison to our regular daily clothing. Aesthetically, many users have concerns wearing garments that might be pursued as different by their peers. The findings demonstrate that individuals want compression clothing that blend in with their style and wardrobes rather than appearing to be coping tools that draw attention. Finally, use experience relates to donning and doffing, initiating and controlling the compression. The findings brought about contradicting results related to donning and doffing. While in some cases where small children are involved, self-donning and doffing was a negative factor, whereas with older population, ease of donning and doffing due to tight-fitting structure of these clothing was highly needed. Currently available products rely on wearer, put on weights or pump air to initiate the compression application, or the compression is constantly available embedded as a negative stretch in a tight-fitting garment. Design requirements developed are taken as the point of departure in our functional and aesthetic design choices when creating the reactive undershirt that uses primitive compression to mimic the therapeutic touch of a hug. Our research showed that most wearable products such as vests and jackets are geared towards kids and are not necessarily designed to be unobtrusive. We target older adults who can benefit from compressive tactile actuation to get relief from anxiety that may be associated with different conditions. This has led us to create a design that is discreet 
and wearable as an undershirt, which can be made in different sizes to accommodate individuals of different body sizes. To address location and amount of compression, we developed a single inflatable bladder that covers back and sides of torso and the shoulders. The air is pumped into the system from a single point, leading to gradual increase in the pressure. We continue to uh, iterate in our prototype development process. To address product comfort, we inferred that fabric weight, stretch, and softness are crucial considerations in designing a garment that meets the user's comfort needs. We designed inflatable bladder using single jersey cotton blend stretch knit fabric which was then laminated with thermoplastic polyurethane membrane to make it airtight while maximizing comfort and minimizing noise. Two layers of laminated knit fabric were heat sealed to form the inflatable bladder in a strategically pleated structure for full range of movement so that the design is tight but not restrictive. The pleats are created in alternating angles to confirm the curvatures of the body. In addition, inflatable bladder is shaped in racer back form to allow for comfortable shoulder movement and thermal comfort at the underarm area. The patterns of the reactive undershirt are also zoned strategically to use mesh knit fabric in areas of the body that are more likely to sweat to increase breathability and four-way extra stretch fabric on the stomach chest area to maximize the ease of movement. In order to reduce bulk and discomfort of seams, we use flat overlock seams on knit textiles. To address concerns regarding visual style, the reactive undershirt is designed as an undershirt to make it more discreet and avoid any unwanted attention. On the other hand, the reactive undershirt still has athletic style design with different knit textiles on, racer back cut if it's to be worn as a single layer. The reactive undershirt provides a unique use experience with a context-aware compression function. The smart undershirt utilizes e-textile-based heart rate variability sensors to detect anxiety and trigger the air pump to inflate the air tight bladder. We used HRV or heart rate variability to detect emotional arousal. Silver coated polyamide yarn was used to embroider the electrodes and conductive tracks on the inner lining of the undershirt using a CAD embroidery machine. Two embroidered ECG electrodes were located on the chest, while one uh, ground electrode was located at the back. We calculated HRV in time domain from the ECG sensor by detecting the fluctuation in the time intervals between adjacent heartbeats. HRV can be calculated in the long term, 24 hours, short term, around 5 minutes, an ultra short term, less than five minutes. In our design, short term and ultra short term HRV were used by calculating standard deviation of the interbeat inter intervals of normal sinus beats. A microcontroller controlled a mini pump to inflate the air bladder and maintain the inner pressure of the air bladder by proportional integral derivative control with a pressure sensor. And the microcontroller also dynamically controlled a valve to deflate the air bladder when the wearer calmed down. The early prototype of the reactive undershirt shows potential to be complementary to improving anxiety disorders and many other disorders by providing a context-aware therapeutic compression. It also exemplifies how smart clothing and textiles can act as non-pharmaceutical rehabilitation alternative for multiple disorders. The challenges we faced in this early prototyping stage included the contact loss between the electrodes and the skin during movement, false positive and negative responses from the electrodes, and also testing of the prototypes themselves as we were testing them 
on ourselves and it is not possible to suddenly increase or decrease heart rate and finally fit of the undershirt has to be specific to a person in order for it to function properly so we continue to work on these challenges in our upcoming prototypes thank you for listening this talk Hi everyone, in this position paper, our goal, uh, Luen and I, our goal is to initiate a dialogue among HCI researchers about the current research and future directions on anthropomorphism in implementing health virtual coaches. In this presentation, we summarize key research trends on anthropomorphism in virtual coaches and present three future directions on this area that expands on and addresses gaps from previous studies. So incorporating virtual agents as coaches into health domain is highly desirable for many reasons. First, virtual coaches can work together with human coaches to provide large-scale and long-term interventions. They can provide emotional and informational support to users whenever desired 24-7. Second, virtual coaches, they cannot make judgments of users, and as a result, human users may feel more comfortable seeking advice from them compared to human coaches. And in light of these benefits, designing effective virtual coaches is of critical importance and many researchers and designers see anthropomorphizing coaches as an important factor. So anthropomorphism is when human, human users attribute human-like features to non-humans. And against this backdrop, in this paper, we aim to discuss some promises and challenges of enhancing anthropomorphic aspects of virtual coaches. We'll first summarize existing health-related research on anthropomorphism based on physical and non-physical dimensions. Then we propose several future directions from both theoretical and empirical standpoints that seek to implicate future healthcare practices. So current research on anthropomorphism can be grouped into two areas, research on physical aspects of anthropomorphism and research on non-physical aspects of anthropomorphism. So first, let us talk about the first category. So designing human-like virtual coaches can rely on tailoring their physical attributes to match those of humans. One prominent technique involves increasing virtual coaches' facial and body resemblance to human counterparts. And human-like virtual coaches will have very realistic eyes, nose, hairs, and eyelashes, and past studies suggest that these coaches are rated more likable, more credible, and more persuasive compared to less human-like virtual coaches. For the second group, researchers have focused on making virtual coaches with the capacity to express health-related emotions, which are essential to build rapport and intimacy with human users. So for instance, um, under this category, virtual coaches can express emotions through facial expressions as well as through their hand gestures. And some virtual coaches can also express empathy by showing their active listening skill to human users, and also by providing affirmation 
to human users' current progress. And some research indicates that emotional and empathetic virtual coaches can lead to greater behavior changes and sense of report and higher liking and enjoyment compared to non-emotional and non-empathetic virtual coaches. And in addition, these coaches can also possess other relationship building characteristics, such as um, the capacity to carry out small talks. And in making small talks, virtual coaches can check on how users are doing and ask if some interesting events have occurred in their life. And they can also make conversations more interesting by incorporating emoticons and GIF, also known as graphics interface format, and making jokes. So in some virtual coaches, they possess diverse human-like physical and non-physical cues. And it may be that human-like virtual coaches allow users to apply human social rules, thus reducing cognitive uncertainties that users might experience when interacting with virtual entities. Or these coaches may be able to exert greater social influence by making users feel as if they're interacting with another real human entity. And lastly, under the law of similarity attraction, they may appear more attractive to users by simply being similar to humans. So given this background, what would be our next steps as HCI researchers? so that we can continue to create meaningful and helpful human-like virtual coaches in the health domain. We now outline three directions that HCI researchers can explore with human-like virtual coaches. And our proposed directions um, aim to extend insights drawn from previous studies. So direction one, which anthropomorphic cues are essential and non-essential in eliciting perception of humanness. So in some studies, the effect of individual anthropomorphic feature was not isolated, but instead, researchers examined the combined effect of all anthropomorphic features. So in these studies, virtual coaches possessed many human-like cues, such as the capacity to carry a small talks, um, empathetic and such, and we do not know which human-like cue was mainly responsible for eliciting positive user outcomes. As a result, some anthropomorphic cues might be more powerful in eliciting the perception of humanness in a non-human agent than others. For instance, it has been shown that the presence of the eyes and the mouth in a 2D computer interface was powerful enough to influence users. And given this, we believe that it is crucial to identify the essential and the non-essential anthropomorphic features. That is, which anthropomorphic features are essential to elicit the perception of humanness in a virtual health coach and which features are not essential. If the presence of eyes is a sufficient cue, then researchers of virtual health coaches can allocate more resources to design a coach with human-like eyes. Moreover, it is possible that a particular anthropomorphic feature with a negative effect may decrease the positive effects of other features, thereby decreasing the magnitude of virtual coaches' total effect. For instance, human users react negatively to non-human entities with mind, and the negative effect of the presence of a mind in virtual coaches may negate the positive effects of other anthropomorphic features, which can lead to less behavioral changes in users. So direction two, what are acceptable and unacceptable human characteristics in virtual coaches? Um, it is important that we dispel the assumption that human-like virtual coaches equal positive user experience. We know from Uncanny Valley that increasing the level of humanness in non-human entities can lead to user liking up to a certain point after which the liking decreases in a deep 
and then increases again. And one interesting observation from these literatures is that virtual agents that seemingly possess empathy can elicit negative user reactions because this characteristic is considered uniquely human. However, empathy is the most embedded characteristic in virtual coaches. And given this contradiction between the literature on Uncanny Valley and the current design practice with virtual coaches, it is urgent that we examine the individual effect of anthropomorphic feature and understand the direction of each effect to resolve this contradiction. And we have taken our own initiative to identify other uniquely human characteristics that users perceive virtual coaches should or should not possess. In one study, we examined how human users reacted to small talks initiated by Andy, who educated users about the importance of exercise. So small talks can be considered a unique property of humans because they involve talking about topics that reflect various aspects of our human culture. So in this study, some participants interacted with Andy, who made small talks on selfie taking or on proper etiquette, as if they had participated in the event before. However, participants in the control condition saw Andy, who did not make any small talks. And we found that participants who interacted with Andy, who made small talks, perceived less interactivity, and they also felt greater threat to their uniqueness compared to those participants in the control condition. Hence, our study results imply that a virtual health coach who engages in small talks can bring about negative user experiences compared to participants who interacted with a virtual coach who does not engage in small talks. And our findings contradict past studies demonstrating the positive effect of small talks in virtual health coach, which brings us back to our earlier point about the need to isolate the effect of each anthropomorphic feature in a virtual coach. That said, um, it also seems that some human characteristics are acceptable by human users. In another study, we examined how users would react to the use of emojis and GIF by virtual coaches. In this study, participants interacted with a stress management virtual coach that used diverse GIF or emoticons, and we found that this virtual coach was rated as playful, non-eerie, and the coach was perceived as very warm and competent. And our study results imply that human users welcome virtual coaches' adoption of certain human culture practice, operationalized as two digital cues in our study. So taken together, we feel the need for more research in this area and invite other human-computer interaction researchers to join our effort to understand acceptable and not acceptable human characteristics in virtual coaches. And we recommend um, HCI researchers to consult a literature on human uniqueness as this line of work has already identified some human characteristics that are not considered that are considered uniquely human and other characteristics that are considered to be shared with other non-human entities. And this will be a nice starting point where we can survey users about how threatened they would feel to see a virtual coach with those identified uniquely human and commonly shared characteristics. And the last direction, direction number three, which user characteristics are important in shaping experience with virtual coaches. So some studies have extensively focused on the technical aspects of virtual coach, and therefore they seldom acknowledge the important role of individual difference variables in dictating users' experience with virtual coaches, such as gender, personality, 
and age. And we know from the literature on social robots and embodied conversational agents that these variables can critically determine user adoption and experiences with non-human agents. Therefore, we really need to consult existing theories on anthropomorphism to identify which user characteristics are important to reflect on. And one prominent theory is a three-factor theory of anthropomorphism. So this theory argues that there are dispositional, situational, developmental, and cultural factors that guide people's tendency to anthropomorphize a non-human object. For instance, people who are chronically lonely or who have a high desire to interact effectively with one's environment anthropomorphize non-human agents to a greater degree. So following the central assumption of this theory, we can argue that human users with a high tendency to anthropomorphize virtual coaches would benefit the most from interacting with human-like virtual coaches. Also, one can argue that users with a low tendency to anthropomorphize may benefit from interacting with any virtual coaches regardless of their level of anthropomorphic cues. So if researchers can personalize the level of anthropomorphism in these virtual coaches based on users' unique standing on situational, dispositional, cultural, and developmental factors, such personalized human-like coach can foster positive user reactions and outcomes towards the coach and the intervention content to a greater extent than non-personalized human-like virtual coach. So in this workshop, um, we have presented at least three exciting research agendas to explore on the topic of anthropomorphism in virtual coach in the domain of health. Uh, we hope that our position paper can initiate dialogue among HCI researchers to reflect on where we currently stand in this area, as well as to discuss the future of human-like virtual coach. And thank you so much for listening, and we hope that you send us with your thoughts and comments to our position paper. Hello, my name is Juris Heise from Ghent University and I'll be presenting our work on analyzing user interaction with mobile health applications through Markov chains. So virtual coaching is basically when you have a system with, which provides a channel between a healthcare practitioner and a patient. And through this channel, the two can communicate with each other uh, from a distance. And this makes it really easy for them to co connect with each other and to exchange information um, outside of the office of the uh, healthcare practitioner. And this system has a lot of potential, but it really becomes difficult to use when there are a lot of patients. So how can the healthcare practitioner know which patient needs uh, interventions on, and what should the intervention be about? And that's why I need that we need um, algorithms, preferably really simple and lightweight algorithms that can analyze our users, can extract some insights and use those insights to inform the health healthcare practitioner about what is going on so that he or she can give the right intervention at the right time. And this is, this is what this paper is going to be about. It's a way of analyzing our users so that we can extract insights from their behavior. So, as I said, we want to extract insights from behavior. So that is basically extracting insights from data. But data in itself has very little meaning. If I tell you 120, you don't know what this means. But if I say that 120 is my current heart rate, and I have, uh, and I have information about my heart rate some time ago, and you also know, for example, that I'm currently giving a presentation. By combining all these data points and by applying a little bit of expert knowledge, 
we can probably deduce that since I'm giving a presentation and my heart rate is elevating, I'll probably have some, uh, have a little bit of stress. So by combining our data points and extracting and, and applying expert knowledge, we can extract insights. And a, this is exactly what we want to do. Um, so what data are we going to use? I think typically when we think of data, we think of wearables uh, for collecting, for example, heart rate. Um, but there's one sort of data that I think has been overseen. And that is the way people or data collected from the way people interact with a system, in this case, a mobile application. In my opinion, th this interaction can already uh, contain a lot of insights. For example, if you have a health application which provides information about a certain condition and you know that your, uh, your patient is frequently uh, consulting this information, then this might be really relevant information that you can use during an interve intervention later on. So you want to be able to extract that insight, that information from the interaction. And how are we going to do this? In this paper, we present a technique that is based on Markov chains. But before we go further into the actual working of the algorithm, um, we're first, I'm first going to explain the use case that we applied this on. So the use case was part of a project called Petronas, and the goal of the project was to develop a user-centered and blended care solution for uh, anxiety therapy. And as you might know, the most effective treatment for anxiety therapy is actually exposure therapy, which basically means exposing the patient to that which he fears the most. Typically, this is done in real life, um, but for this project, we focused on uh, exposure therapy and virtual reality. So that meant that the environments uh, that the user was exposed to were actually simulated in a virtual environment. So on the one hand, uh, the patient could receive exposure therapy with the therapist in the office. Uh, but once the patient leaves the office, uh, we wanted to be able to sort of continue therapy. Um, and that is where the mobile, fo mobile phone application comes in. Through the mobile phone, the, the therapy can actually be extended in between uh, sessions. And the, and the phone... Be and and the application becomes a channel between the user and the therapist. So the application itself has three main goals. First off, the user can perform homework, homework exercises through the application. This can either be in virtual reality, so the same simulations that he sees with therapist can be simulated on a mobile phone, or they can be assignments for the patient to perform in real life. Second goal is motivation. Through goals that have been uh, set together with the therapist, the user is motivated to uh, successfully complete them and therefore finish the therapy. And then lastly, uh, there is logging. Since if the user leaves the therapist's office, there's very little that the therapist knows about what is going on. And one way of remediating this is by having the user self-report on his feelings or his emotions in between sessions. So through a self-journaling, self so through a logging page, the user could uh, provide this information. Additionally, the application also supported connecting a wearable uh, so that physiological data could be collected. In order to perform our analysis, uh, some data was collected, so we can illustrate the potential of this, system, of this approach. So we asked three users to use the application over a period of two weeks. And the application was populated with a few exercises and a few goals specifically for those users. The data that we collected was obviously the, way, uh, the interaction with the application. But what this specifically means is that we recorded which pages the users uh, visited together with a timestamp. And that way we could reconstruct the way in which the user interacts and visits certain pages uh, in the application. So a trace 
starts when the user opens the application and it stops when the user uh, closes the application. So now we can start uh, analyzing our data. And before going directly to uh, the approach using Markov chains, I first want to look at some simpler uh, techniques or simple ways of looking at the data. And the first thing that we can do is look at uh, the stat static characteristics of the data. For example, how many times did each user visit each page? And we can plot this out. This gives us a certain distribution. What this tells us is, for example, that certain pages, pages have been visited more often than other pages. It also tells us that not every user uh, behaves the exact same, but it also shows that there's quite some similarity between users. But does this really tell us which page is more, most important? Not really, because it only tells us which page has been visited, not what the user did on that page or how, long, how much time he spent on that page. So we can take into account the time uh, each page has been visited. This gives us a new distribution and this shows, shows us much more clearly that there are a few pages which are really important because the user spent a lot of time on them. And there are other pages that are really not that important at all. For example, a transition page or a page that shows there is no internet connection. Also differences between users become much more clear uh, showing in this bar plot. So this is better, but it doesn't really give us that much information about the order in which uh, the user visited certain pages. So we want to dive a little deeper and dig a little, little deeper to see if we find more information. So we look at the dynamic characteristics, the order in which the user visited the pages. And if we don't have that much data, we can plot this out, for example, like this, where each row in this plot represents a trace. The cells in each row are pages. And the color of each cell is basically what type of page it refers to. So what we see is that there are traces of different lengths. There are traces with different colors. For example, these traces don't contain any blue cells. Um, and all these differences, differences indicate uh, differences in behavior. But we also see similarities. For example, there are certain patterns that reoccur in different traces. So, in order to understand this, we could potentially try to manually analyze all these traces, see, see which patterns uh, occur, and try to figure out what it means. But if you have a lot of data, that's not really feasible. So we need a way of doing this in a more automatic way. And that is where Markov chains come in. So a Markov chain is a way of describing a stochastic system or a time series. And in our case, these systems are uh, the interaction from the user with, this, with a, a mobile application. So a Markov chain can be uh, shown as a graph, such as this one, where you have different states and transitions between states. And each transition has a probability. In our case, transitions, uh, sorry, in our case, states are going to be pages of the application while transitions are transition from one page to another. So in this case, we have a 50% probability of going from state A to state B, and a 50% probability to go from A to C. Markov chains have two interesting properties that we're going to use. The first is, if you give it a bunch of uh, traces, then you can generate a Markov chain from that data and the Markov chain will describe the stochastic behavior that is captured in those traces. So basically now the Markov chain encodes the behavior in the traces. The second property is if you have a Markov chain and you give it a new trace, you can calculate the probability that a trace has been generated by the Markov chain. In other words, the probability shows you how likely it is that the behavior captured in the Markov chain is present in a certain trace. So how are we exactly going to use Markov chains to extract insights? Well, each Markov chain is going to 
describe a different behavior or a different goal um, that can be accomplished within the application. And then by using the second property, we can calculate or we can label traces based on each Markov chain and therefore label them with a certain behavior or a certain insight. Now there are two ways of doing this. The first way is a rather manual way where you manually create a Markov chain for each type of behavior that you want to recognize. So each insight is described as a Markov chain. In this case we have one for perform MVR exercises, we also have one for logging information. So we capture that behavior in a simple Markov chain and once we have this we label our traces and we do this using the second property. So for each trace in this example we calculate the probability that it has been generated by each Markov chain. And then using a simple thresholding algorithm we say for example in this case when the probability is above 70% we actually label the trace. So in this case probability for trace 1 to be generated by Markov chain 1 was 95% and 40% for Markov chain 2. This one is above 70 so we say that this trace contains behavior describing uh, performing a VR exercise. Trace 2 this doesn't describe any behavior while trace 3 actually describes multiple behaviors. So it is possible that one session, so one trace, contains multiple different uh, goals or intentions of the user. This is a, a feasible solution when the Markov chains are relatively simple and we know which insights we are looking for. But in some cases you don't know what you are looking for. So we want a technique to extract the insights in an unsupervised way. And this means clustering together similar uh, traces and having a Markov chain that describes the behavior of these traces. So we're going to divide our, uh, our data points into different clusters. In the example that I'm going to give, we suppose we assume there are three clusters. So in the first step, we assign a random label to each data point. There are three clusters so we use three colors. We group together the data points and for each cluster we generate the Markov chain. Next, once we have three Markov chains, we can again label each data point based on these three Markov chains. So we give them a new label. Some data points will change label but others will remain will have the same label. Now they have new labels, we can group them back together and again generate a Markov chain from that, which is repetition of step two. We continue doing this until we reach convergence. One, when this happens, we, have, we now have a cluster of data points which describe similar behavior and we have a Markov chain which also encodes that behavior. So in order to understand which insights they contain, we now simply have to analyze the Markov chains. And analyzing the Markov chain is much easier uh, than actually analyzing all the traces because the Markov chain has a really structured format and it's easy to recognize what kind of behavior they describe. In our example, on our data set, uh, we actually found that there are indeed three main groups of interaction. Uh, the first one was related to connecting a wearable to the mobile application. The second one was regarding uh, self-reporting or logging of information. And then the third one is regarding checking the personal goals in the application. So to conclude, in this work, we illustrated the potential of Markov chains for analyzing uh, interactions with mobile application. And it's a really useful approach because it's semi-unsupervised. We don't have to know up, um, up front which insights we want to uh, extract from the data, but we can uh, find these insights through this analysis. 
in the end the goals are encoded in a Markov chain so we simply have to analyze the Markov chains themselves which is still a manual step and additionally the system or this, appro this approach is actually extendable to other systems as well not only interaction with mobile applications but also interaction within the other system secondly it we show that uh, interaction with a system actually contains some insights and that we can extract those insights and, as, and I really think it's interesting to see that even from interaction with a system we can learn something about the user that we can then use in virtual coaching further down the road and then lastly I think it's really important that we research new techniques to better understand our users so we can improve virtual coaching and provide better interventions. Thank you for listening to my presentation.
Hello everyone, my name is Tudor Vakaretsu and I am a PhD candidate at Eindhoven University of Technology Industrial Design Department. Today I will talk about a design research into the needs of sleep diary for children. This work is a collective effort with my co-authors Sigrid Pilen, Sebastian Overeim, Thomas Visser and Panos Markopoulos. 30% of children under the age of 3 have difficulty falling asleep for a period of time or frequently wake up at night with a major influence on the daily functioning of the child and certainly also of the parents. For somnologists and pediatricians to be able to treat sleep disorders, capturing sleep data either objectively or subjectively is essential. To capture subjective sleep data, sleep diaries have been developed either in a digital or physical format. There have been efforts to standardize sleep diaries, such as the consensus sleep diary. There has been limited research to understand the necessities of sleep diaries for children. It is important to know which aspects of insomnia and its consequences are particularly detrimental to the functioning of the child and the parents when developing such a sleep diaries. Therefore, we conducted an interview-based investigation into the aspects that are perceived as important by the child and the parents in relation to the child's sleep, but also by the somnologist who treats and consults patients. A sleep diary for children has several types of users, patients and professionals. In order to understand the context of use for diaries, patients have been observed during meetings with the sleep experts. The target group for patients was defined to be children between 1 to 12 years old that suffer of severe insomnia affecting the daily functioning of the child or the family system around the child. Given the young age, it is the parents who fill in the sleep diary for the child, therefore the interviews were scheduled with the parents. In total, six parents and six professionals have been interviewed during the first step of the design process. The interviews were transcribed and coded and a list of requirements, both functional and non-functional, has been created based on the coded interviews. Requirements were prioritized in five separate categories, from highest priority to lowest priority. First three categories have been chosen for implementation as they represent 85.54% of the total requirements. Given that 71 out of a total of 83 of requirements reside in the top three priority categories, it was clear that with such a vast amount of requirements, the sleep diary might become too complex for the user. 
A digital modular approach was conceptualized for the implementation. If we have a glance at the schema on the left, we can see a concept of the application workflow. First, the patient has a first meeting with the specialist. After a short interview with the patient, the specialist understands his needs and configures the patient profile in the backend of the application. A set of credentials is given to the patient. When patient logs in for the first time, the application makes a request to retrieve the configuration set by the specialist after the interview. The sleep diary will be configured for the patient's needs. For a period of at least two weeks, the patient has to fill in sleep diary data in the application. The data is saved daily and saved in the database. At any moment, the specialist can request patient's data and visualize and analyze it. Many of the requirements thus identified could equally well apply to sleep diaries for adults. We thus assessed the extent to which a sleep diary for adults called HYPNOS satisfies these requirements and we observed that 16 out of 71 requirements have already been implemented in HYPNOS. Therefore, we decided to extend the HYPNOS sleep diary. On the left side of the slide we can have a glance at the first prototype based on HYPNOS sleep diary. The top row of icons represents the states and events related to sleep behavior. A wake in bed, a sleep daytime nap, a wake out of bed, a sleep out of bed or screen time. All these states can be selected and drawn with a swipe gesture on the timeline below. The timeline is the sleep diary which will be further analyzed by the specialist. The timeline is divided into 15 minute time segments. The lights off, lights on markers can be dragged to certain timestamps to specify the moment the child went to bed for sleeping and the moment he got out of bed. Special days such as birthdays, holidays or vacations which have an impact on child's sleep will be marked with a star in the calendar icon. Under the timeline there is another row of icons that allows the parents to fill in extra information about their child's sleep. For example, if he did not sleep in his own bed, whether he slept with his parents, information about an illness or medication given to the child. When such an icon is selected, a new text box, text box will appear to allow input from parents. The data will be further saved and synchronized with the database. We presented research and insights regarding the design process of developing a new sleep diary for children and also clear outcomes. A list of requirements has been created based on user research and a first iteration prototype is presented. As future work, evaluation against requirements is the natural step to follow. If the evaluation proves to be positive, a reflection on the advantages of such a system could uncover interesting facts. Hello everyone, it's our poster about data-driven analysis of Parkinson's disease and its detection at an early stage. So, Parkinson's disease is a neurological disorder that has some symptoms like tremor, bradygenesia, gait freezing, and it could lead to terrible outcome without proper therapy. There are a lot of papers based on only one type of data, since I have written out a video and based on the one type of exercise, based on the one method and so on, but we mainly focused on combination of exercises. We have three main goals of this project. First one is early stage detection, second one is Parkinson's disease stage and third one is outlier detection. For this poster we mainly focus on early stage detection. There are three main objectives for our project. First one is create the experiment test bed for data collection. Second one design the set of motion tests, of course approved by neurologists. And last one is perform analysis using machine learning and deep learning algorithm. Our experiment start to look like this. We have variable devices located on the pile. Also all experiments 
were recorded on the camera and data were collected on the server. Totally we have 15 exercises. We divided it into four main groups. First one is gross motor, is general movements. Second one is fine motor, exercise with small coordination, small movements. Third one is clinic evaluation, it's what usually doctor used to evaluate tremor. And last one is tremor the rest when the body don't move. In this slide I present you the full list of exercises. In more details you can find the information in the poster. How does the set look like this? We have 74 patients, a lot of them with Parkinson's disease, but we also have healthy patients and patients with non Parkinson's disease like dystony and so on. And here is an example of our data and location of our device on the power. Here is an example of our data collection system and you can see that there are uh, devices located on the palm and this is one of the exercises with from group tremor and the rest. Our analysis started with filtering. First of all we apply high pass filter for removing limb orientation. After this we decided to separate tremor and parkinesia features because it's related to different frequency. The next step was feature extraction from tremor and brandykinesia. For this one we applied Fourier analysis. Uh, in this plot you can easily see separation between peaks for tremor part and brandykinesia part. So we extract something like mean, minimum, maximum values of these peaks for tremor and for bradykinesia part and use this like features. Second one is feature selection methods. We use mean impurity degrees for random forest, key square and removing features with low variance. After this we applied some machine learning algorithm like random forest, support vector machine and logistic regression. Our results are shown in this slide. First thing what we can do is uh, classify the exercise what our patients performed. For this task we show the rock curves. Our area under curve is almost one, it's very very nice results. The next step is early stage detection. We try to classify the healthy and parking disease first stage based on subset of exercise. So here exercise number 11 and Two are the most interesting because they have shown the best results according to the receiving operator characteristic. This exercise are from clinic evaluation group and it's what doctor usually use to detect Parkinson's disease. If you're interested in this problem you can also read some papers from our team. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Hello, this presentation will briefly outline our project, Design and Evaluation of Mobile Mental Health Resources for First Responders, and highlight our design recommendations. This was a year-long project and the two broad objectives were understanding people's needs as they seek mental health resources and evaluating how a mobile tool can help meet those needs. In the fall of 2009, we carried out a literature review, heuristics evaluation, stakeholder interviews, and performed resource categorization to better structure and guide our design process. All these designs helped us 
uncover the attributes of mobile apps for mental health resourcing that are most impactful and those that may be less optimal from a user perspective or resource attributes. Based on these initial findings from fall of 2019, we developed the initial low fidelity designs of the mobile app. Then we conducted a focus group discussion with a set of stakeholders. We found that it was more important that we, than we had initially expected to create a personalized experience flow for different user groups. This would reflect in the resource categorization, apply filters to see the relevant results, favoriting and sharing resources and other features. In the spring of 2020, we conducted another focus group with a set of stakeholders to further refine the design. Prior to the focus group, we used card sorting to further analyze how we wanted the interface to look like and what kinds of resource categorization we thought would fit for the different user groups. We then created the high fidelity designs and then carried out usability testing during the focus group. The five main categories that we recommended for the final app design were resources, favorites, chat, donate, and about. Broad design specifications that we kept in mind as we started working on the app included created an extensive onboarding flow to provide as much customization to the user as possible, use everyday language and avoid any jargon, and provide dynamic filters at every stage. Here are examples of our onboarding. everyday language, and dynamic filters. Our usability testing on this design showed that range of severity of symptoms was something that the participants might find useful to represent in the resource options, and that most participants wanted to see potentially all kinds of help centers regardless of their filters. Positive feedback on the app centered on personalized experience, the chatbot feature, the ability to share and favorite resources, and the clean and straightforward flow. Areas of improvement included making the onboarding categories broader, restricting the use of horizontal scrolling, and making the chat feature more comprehensible. Thank you, and please contact the principal investigator, Dr. Courtney Crooks, for further questions. This study examines the current technology of diabetes management devices, primarily insulin pumps. Insulin pumps are effective tools for the precise control of glucose levels for type 1 diabetes patients. Many design and usability challenges do still exist with pump technology, and in this study we investigated current shortcomings and limitations of insulin pumps through survey and interview data collection methods. Our findings revealed issues with current insulin pumps including wearability and accessibility in public, operating devices while performing demanding tasks, interruptions with social activities and interactions, continual maintenance, and interface operations. Our study aspires to inform the future design of novel insulin pumps that enable people with type 1 diabetes to maintain better control of their glucose levels through consistent and steady interactions with these tools during their everyday activities. Starting with literary and market research, we outlined a collection of popular devices and applications currently being used. Wearable pumps can be classified into two main categories. Traditional pumps, where the tubing connects the pump to an infusion set attached to the body, and patch pumps, 
which are worn directly on the body like a patch. Modern pumps generally work with a continuous glucose monitor. The continuous monitor is worn like a patch. It penetrates the skin and takes glucose measurements every few minutes. Glucose readings are typically sent to a separate monitor or smartphone app. Companies have also introduced closed-loop systems where the CGM can communicate glucose levels to the pump, allowing the pump to make some automated adjustments to insulin delivery. Members of the DIY community have also started hacking pumps due to limitations they find in the current technology. Solutions like this have been pioneered by people like Dana Lewis, who modified her own insulin pump in order to customize the alarm to wake herself up at night if she experienced a low blood sugar. The most notable DIY system works on a Raspberry Pi-based device called a Riley Link. The Riley Link connects a compatible pump to the smartphone app Loop. This is a fully customizable and automated system that allows people to control pumps from their mobile devices. It's not sold as a set of medical devices. Instead, the apps and devices are distributed through open source communities. It's worth mentioning that the FDA has yet to approve of a system where you can control an insulin pump using a smartphone. After initial research, the online survey was deployed on a statewide Facebook support group for the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, or JDRF. It was also deployed on a nationwide JDRF forum, garnering 105 responses. Some insights included data that 30% of respondents use their pumps without looking at the display and 56% wish their pumps convey more information in a non-visual manner. A multiple choice question asked which features people would most like to have in a new insulin pump design. The two most popular responses were remote device, followed by better haptic responses, and finally sending information to a family member. The two open-ended questions revealed deeper insight into people's experiences. Answers were organized into affinity diagrams, then distilled into graphic charts, which highlighted some of the more significant responses. In responses to the question, describe a situation when using your pump was awkward or difficult. The most frequent responses had to do with subjects of being hard to access from its wearing location or through clothing, interruptions during social activities where the pump draws attention, feedback and alert issues, and wearability pain points. For the open question, what new feature do you want in a future pump? The most common requests were control from a smartphone, updating the physical form to be smaller, easier to wear, or less medical looking, streamlining the navigation, and better, more customizable alerts and feedback. Interviews were conducted after gleaning insights from the survey responses. Seven people were interviewed from across the metro Atlanta area including two people who use the Riley Link open source system. Interview format started with introductory questions focused on pump type, wearing location, and inquiring about any other third-party apps or products that participants may use. Later questions focused on situational topics, mostly derived from the open-ended survey comments. Example questions included, what would you do if you need to use your pump while driving? And, do you ever find yourself in situations where it might be socially awkward to use your pump? What have you done in those situations? We examined wearing locations and created a visual diagram to help show areas where a person with type 1 diabetes might carry his or her device. This helped to show some of the challenges pump users face in greater detail. Here we also saw that women face significant wearability challenges. For example, participant 6 discussed her wedding day, having to ask her mom to carry her smartphone and Riley Link devices so she wouldn't have to carry a purse or an extra case down the aisle. Journey maps were created to help pinpoint areas where people experience the most challenges in a given situation. On performing demanding activities, the two common threads among people were that they are either distracted by their own devices, or the device is responsible for drawing unwanted attention. On the subject of driving, all participants had stories to share. While three of the seven participants said they do not interact with their pumps while driving, all people agreed that trying to use a pump in this situation is not advisable and potentially dangerous. Formal occasions are another scenario where pumps and CGMs draw unwanted attention. The journey map also highlighted specific wearability challenges for women. Initial findings in this study have revealed some insight into the hardships people with type 1 diabetes face. 
continual maintenance, operating pumps during social activities, accessibility, and wearability emerged as major challenges with current insulin pumps. Wearability was revealed to be an especially significant challenge for women. Interface operation was a popular discussion topic in interviews and survey comments. Pump interfaces vary widely, and many user flows incorporate a series of confirmation screens designed to prevent things like accidental boluses. It's important to determine where confirmation screens are necessary, but may still be possible to design streamlined user flows. On a more universal level, the survey and interviews revealed a number of situations, like during social activities or while performing demanding tasks, where people have to interact with their pumps but don't want to look at the displays. A user-centered approach may be beneficial for the future iterations on designing interfaces and user flows for pumps. The next phase of this project is to gather data from participatory design workshops, then prototype pump interface designs based on the input from all of these people with type 1 diabetes. Finally, we plan on conducting a series of user tests to evaluate the model interface's efficacy for people with type 1 diabetes. Hi, I'm Philips from Singapore Management University and I'm going to present our work Footbot, a goal-oriented just-in-time healthy eating interventions chatbot. Maintaining healthy eating habits is a key factor in reducing the risk of chronic preventable diseases. However, it is difficult to achieve due to lack of motivation, poor self-regulation, and personal bias. In recent years, we see mHealth application as a cost-effective way to facilitate healthy eating lifestyle at a population scale. However, few design flaws lead to unintended user behavior. For example, tedious nature of manual data entry effort, poor data coverage, and overly emphasized caloric and weight goals. In this work, we present a chatbot-based mHealth application for goal-oriented just-in-time healthy eating interventions, incorporating natural language user interface, large-scale food knowledge graph, goal setting, and cheat intervention and recommendation. Foodbot is an application built on top of Dialogflow platform. It has three main components. Conversation Engine, Call Services, and Data Store. User interact to Footbot via voice commands, clicks on embedded components, and free text input. The Conversation Engine is responsible for processing natural language inputs, determining user intents and corresponding tasks, and managing dialogue state. The core services component provides backend functionality to the conversation engine, utilizing both food knowledge graph and user data. The first functionality is food logging, which provides basic services for food journaling, and it also provides essential user data for other modules. Foodbot also reminds users to log their food entries on a daily basis via notification prompts. The second functionality is personalized food recommendation. It suggests food items for each meal occasion based on user past food intake. The recommendation is delivered either using cheat intervention before regular meal time or normal user requests. The third functionality is goal setting and cheat intervention. Users can ask Foodbot to keep track of dietary intake goals, and the cheat intervention module identifies windows of opportunity to nudge users toward their goals. Foodbot guides users toward realistic, healthy eating goals according to evidence-based 
dietary guidelines. Together, goal setting and JIT intervention provide just-in-time, personalized, and actionable feedback to users. The Food Knowledge Graph provides a comprehensive knowledge base of local food items available from restaurants and grocery stores in Singapore. We collect data from various sources, such as popular online food delivery services, food review websites, and online grocery shopping sites. And we collect more than 177,000 food items. So in conclusion, Foodbot is goal-oriented, just-in-time, healthy eating chatbot. It utilizes natural language user interface to reduce barrier in dietary self-tracking. Large-scale food knowledge craft to cover a wide range of foods and beverages commonly consumed in Singapore. Guided goal setting toward realistic healthy eating goals according to evidence-based dietary guidelines. Notification to nudge users to achieve their goals via deep personalized actionable feedback. Thank you for your attention. Challenge for the design of people-centered pharmaceutical packaging. The needs of people regarding packaging and how their design can contribute to a better user experience are unknown. In Colombia, the distribution of legal medicines is carried out through centers known as drogerias or drugstores. It is worth highlighting the presentation of two particularities regarding the acquisition and use of medicines. The first is that some medicines are over the counter, acquired without the need of a prescription. The second particularity is the selling of medicine by blister units, that is, without the respective pharmaceutical package. Research objectives of this project. First, explore the way people make use of medication package. And second, identify the challenges for the design of medication packaging by applying people-centered design. Methods. An exploratory study test is applied to five people of legal age chosen at random while they wear eye-tracking glasses. The thinking aloud protocol normally used in usability test was applied. People were asked general questions about their experience in the use of medication. The session has an average duration of 25 minutes, were recorded on video and subsequently a category analysis was performed to identify findings. Samples of questions or tasks. Based on your experience with other medication, how do you remember how often you should take the medication and the amount of time the medication should be taken for? If you have any allergies, where do you expect to find this information? From the packaging. Can you make decisions about product storage? Where would you expect to find the expiration date of this product? Is there anything you would like to improve concerning packaging? Insights. The analyzed package do not inform others such as the route of administration, the expiration date, or the appropriate way to dispose the medicine clearly. None of the people knew how to dispose the medicine correctly and the packaging did not tell them how to do it properly either. People manage to memorize the dosage, but there is nothing in the packaging that considers this need. 
it is necessary to explore the brand packaging relationship so that more hierarchies are given to the information regarding the use of the medication over advertising. People want detailed information regarding contraindication and components, but reading the packaging and the instructions is not easy because the font size and the specialized jargon. We agree to a firm like Ding that digital technology could help generate patient-centered medication from different fronts, improving flexibility in current packaging regulation, improving coordination and communication between different stakeholders, mitigating waste and pollution at different stages, and allowing a more autonomous decision-making process through the supply and use chain. It is evident the need to raise parameters so that packaging is not overshadowed by the branding proposed by the laboratories. The development of pharmaceuticals in the near future is expected to follow paradigms such as QBD quality by design that emphasizes holistic product and understanding process. However, it is not yet fully accepted and exploited in the pharmaceutical industry. Hello everyone, I'm Park. I'm really excited to present our research to you. Our team is an interdisciplinary group of faculty, staff, and students who are focused on investigating, developing, and evaluating technologies to serve the needs of older adults and others with physical and cognitive challenges. So we developed uh, new healthcare technologies driven by actual clinical needs and evaluate them in realistic settings. Currently, we have been developing a consumer interface partially utilizing voice-assisted technology for older adults and designated caregiver in accessing their sensor-generated health information, health messages, and full alert. So we'd like to talk about our research process regarding integrating voice-assisted technology with an in-home sensor system on participant-based design study. In the previous work, we developed a health alert system that captures and analyzes data from sensors such as motion sensor, depth sensor, and bed sensor embedded in assisted living facilities. But this system utilizes clinical expertise to review or interpret the data. So we wanted uh, all adults and their caregivers themselves to see and interpret personalized health messages and health alert. So our current work focuses on refining a health alert system and customization from consumer feedback. This research employed a multi-phase research design to solicit feedback from older adults and informal caregivers on the development of a consumer-appropriate interface. Information learned from each phase was built into subsequent phases of uh, the research to uh, iteratively learn about consumers' preferences. We had five focus groups, one family caregiver focus group, and four older adult uh, focus groups. Participants were asked about the sensor technology, health alert, user interface, and method for interacting with health information. Participants expressed a desire for their health information to be shared with their health care providers through for their electronic medical records. They also desired the flexibility in who they can uh, delegate access to such as family members, friends, and former service providers. 
Participants also、uh, stated that they would need guidance in interpreting their health messages and alerts, at least in the beginning, as they are becoming accustomed to with their in-home sensor system. And they were also、uh, shown multiple graphic display options of sensor-generated health data and asked questions about their preferences. Many expressed concerns that older adults did not own the necessary technology, such as smartphone, computer, tablet, or voice-assisted technology, to interface with their health data and cost of technology. Only a few older adult, adult、uh, participants discussed privacy concerns related to the in-home sensor technology, such as images. Generated from particular rooms in their home being transmitted. However, family member participants did not share these concerns as they were solely focused on the well-being of their loved one and their having、uh, the capability to respond to emergency situations with urgency. So、uh, the to、uh, further explore preferences in using voice-assisted technology to retrieve in-home sensor-generated health information, we had 18 diet interviews with old adults and their designated caregiver. Two voice-assisted technology platforms were investigated, and each participant was instructed to、uh, interact with each platform using a prepared scenario. So,、uh, pre-programmed queries that are developed by the research team allow the user to ask the system various questions to retrieve their health information, health、uh, messages, and health alert. The majority of participants believe that the voice-assisted technology was easy to use, and they would be、uh, likely to use it、uh, to retrieve their health information. The Imagine Echo Show device was the favored platform, as they、uh, preferred the larger graph this device displayed. Also,、uh, participants preferred to hear their health information through the voice-assisted technology and short. Prompt that generate concise responses with、uh, the ability to ask follow-up questions. To investigate some of the、uh, some of、uh, the themes、uh, generated from the focus group study, participants were asked questions about flexibility, access delegation, data sharing concerns, and training. They wanted uh, they wanted uh, flexibility in retrieving their health history at any time point, such as yesterday or. Two weeks ago, so many old adult participants wanted to control the type of information their designated caregiver、uh, could access and when. Participants also inquired about the voice-assisted technology capabilities in sharing their health information with their healthcare team. Um, most participants did not have privacy concerns with、uh, the voice-assisted technology. They stated that they would、uh, they would need some training in how to use the device and the question prompt needed to elicit their health information. Overall, technology acceptance was high. In addition to voice-assisted technology, a clo-、uh, I mean. Yeah, a cross-platform web interface has also been、uh, developed for users to view their health information or designated caregivers to view the health information of their loved one. This flexibility in delegating access to the to the health data is a result of feedback in both the focus groups and diet interviews. Currently, uh, uh, the in-home sensor technology and Amazon Echo Show device are being installed in 40 homes of old adults living in independent living facilities. They are being recruited through、uh, the various ways. Also, when consented into the study, study staff arrange an initial date and time to install the sensor system. After the sensor system has been deployed and health data. 
that has been recorded. A subsequent meeting is scheduled with uh, the participant within a few weeks following installation. The purpose of this initial meeting is to further train the participant on using the consumer interfaces to interact with their health information. They may also invite a designated caregiver to participate in this initial meeting. Uh, quarterly interviews are being conducted with a study participants to obtain feedback about the consumer interfaces and health messaging system. So far, overall, participants are satisfied with uh, the consumer interfaces and health messaging system. However, uh, some participants had barriers in using the device to retrieve their health messages. They forgot how to retrieve their health information through the voice-assisted device, and so some did not have time to use it because of their health conditions. Also, family members wanted to receive um, immediate technical support when they faced some issues with the device. Through the focus group study and diet interviews, we identified their preferences and concerns in using voice-assisted technology integrated with an in-home sensor system to self-manage their health. Personalization, sharing data with caregivers and usefulness outweighed the potential risk. So we expect that voice-assisted technology as a consumer interface may be beneficial to many House as as allowing for uh, interaction and display of uh, personalized health messages and alert with ease. If you want to see more information regarding our project, please visit us on the following link. Uh, thank you for your attention. Cardiovascular diseases such as heart failure, coronary heart disease, and high blood pressure are very common in older adults, and their diagnosis usually got delayed to the point that it's too late. Utilizing longitudinal in-home vital sign measurements give clinicians the ability to track long-term trends in patients' health conditions in order to direct clinical decisions. We have been working on in-home embedded systems for unobtrusive monitoring of vital signs based on ballistocardiography or BCG that can specifically benefit older adults at the risk of heart disease. While in-home BCG systems provide a high degree of freedom for the subjects, they are highly susceptible to motion artifacts. Inaccurate estimations of cardiac parameters from the artifact-contaminated BCG records could negatively affect the quality of analysis. This emphasizes the need for methods to make the analysis robust against motion artifacts, such as using noise reduction or noise detection techniques. This paper explores the use of machine learning methods for automatic identification of motion artifacts in BCG signals. We propose a fusion of time and frequency domain features extracted from multiple transducers for the detection. We use two BCG datasets, one collected in the controlled lab setting from 25 young volunteers laying on the bed for a short time, and the other one includes five overnight BCG and PSG recordings from random patients who visited Boone Hospital's sleep lab. We designed a set of 53 features from both time domain and the time frequency domain. After pre-processing, we applied the sequential thresholding technique to transform each feature value to one of the three categories of low, medium, and high intensity, which then used as the input for the machine learning model. We used SVM and ROSBUS classifiers with five-fold cross-validation and provided a comparison of different parameter settings using measurements such as accuracy, sensitivity, and false negative rate. Considering all 53 features, it took about 3 hours for the SVM to finish the cross-validation with the accuracy of 97%, but unfortunately, its sensitivity was as low as 23%, plus a high value for false negative rate around 77%.
We hypothesize that this in part is due to the imbalanced distribution of the two classes. Thus, a balanced data set was made by simply replicating the samples from the smaller class. Similarly, to improve the computational time, we tried using the first five principal components for the classification. As a result of these two steps, the sensitivity of the classification improved to values as high as 98%. On the other hand, we also applied the Rosbus classification as it is known to be fast and also invariant to the imbalanced data sets. Our comparison shows Rasmus is orders of magnitude faster than SVM, specifically on the imbalanced dataset, supported with high sensitivity. To sum it up, we showed in this study how time and spectral features can be used to identify artifacts contaminated segments from the BCG signal. We showed how synthetic resampling and balancing the dataset can significantly improve the sensitivity of algorithms such as SVM, while on the other hand, utilizing algorithms such as Rosbus that are by definition invariant to imbalanced data provides the same level of accuracy and sensitivity with much less computational effort. For the future works, we plan to use this technique to clean up large data sets of BCG signals and create a reliable set of longitudinal BCG measurements to predict valuable trends and changes in health conditions. Hello everyone, my name is Mehrab and I'm a computer science PhD student at Georgia Tech. My talk is going to focus on how we can use passive sensors for measuring self-esteem. I will present the first half of the talk and then my co-primary author, Ghost of Saha, will present the later half of the presentation. So what is self-esteem? Self-esteem corresponds to someone evaluating themselves in the form of how much they like or dislike themselves. Understanding self-esteem can foster adopting preemptive steps to facilitate the psychological and cognitive needs of individuals. Individuals with damaged and lower self-esteem are at a greater risk of psychosocial distress and may be vulnerable to the demanding circumstances of day-to-day -day life. Therefore, measuring self-esteem is extremely important in many cases. There are multiple ways to measure it. The traditional form for measuring self-esteem relies on a survey, which asks experiences of individuals about various things over a long period of time. And such practice generates recall bias for the participants since it is hard for individuals to reflect on experiences that happened earlier compared to the time when they were responding to surveys. Now, how is our approach different? Almost all of us carry a smartphone with us. Some of us use wearables such as smartwatches and these smart devices are equipped with hardware sensors such as accelerometer, microphone, gyroscope, among other things. These sensors can be used for collecting large-scale, continuous, rich and dense longitudinal data that can be used to infer an individual's physical and social activities. Hence, based on the promise of passive sensing, in this project we invest investigated this question. Can we automatically and scalably predict self-esteem using passive sensing modalities available on commodity devices. In order to answer our questions, we worked with Campus Life dataset. Campus Life dataset encompasses passive sensing data and survey data from Georgia Tech students and their well-being during a period of 2016. The Campus Life project recruited over 51 Georgia Tech students. 60% of the participants were males and 40% were females. Two modalities of passive sensing were used in this project. These include smartphone sensors and social media. Passive sensing data 
from smartphones contain various information such as individuals inferred physical activity inferred conversation and communication frequency of text messages and phone calls among other things validated surveys serve as ground truth in the study Kostov will present the next part of the presentation thank you hey i'm kostov and i'm going to walk you uh, walk you through the methods and results of our study so as we aim to predict self esteem using passive sensors we adopt a regression based approach here the ground truth data comes from ema based surveys of self esteem measuring uh, performance social and appearance based self esteem and the features or the independent variables come from passive sensing data including frequency of calls text conversations as well as physical activity based features we adopt leave one out cross validation approach to validate our predictions and among the different prediction algorithms that we built to model self esteem the gradient boosted regressor performed the best across all three kinds of self esteem uh, it shows a low symmetric mean absolute percentage error or smap of around 7% and we also extracted the top features in our predictive models using anova and k based univariate scoring methodologies We note the strong association of social features which aligns with prior literature or that low self esteem often associates with isolation and lack of communication. Now let me reiterate the takeaways of our study. We showed the feasibility to measure self esteem using passive sensing data and our study motivates approaches to proactively understand well-being in situated communities. With that we would like to con conclude our predict uh, presentation and please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions thanks a lot Hi everyone, thank you for listening in. In this work, uh, we're going to present a tool we call Mind for mental health screening and support of therapy to improve clinical and research outcomes. I'm Anis Zaman from University of Rochester, and this work is in collaboration with one of my other mentors, Vincent Salenzio, who is uh, at Rutgers University. The goal of this work is to propose a, a, a framework that can sense individual level. Uh, mental health phenomena such as depression anxiety self esteem using individual level online activities uh, and we hope to show that this system could be easily deployed in a real life setting such as in a clinics and outpatient settings just to motivate this work uh, past work showed that one in five individuals in us experience some level of anxiety mental and uh, mainly me mental health related issues 50% of these Occurs um, by as early as age 14, and sadly, 40% of them receive some level of diagnosis and treatment. So, such high prevalence of uh, mental health phenomena really urged the research community to come together and and uh, do something about it. And we hope this our work would take it to the next level. Just to back a little bit, uh, given our current lifestyle, right? Our, our, a lot of chunk of our daily life is spent online for school, office work, you know, uh, recreation, etc. However, every online activities, right, uh, are logged by the service provider, whatever service we are using. And these logs are some form of byproduct of our activities, which is very rich because it can tell us what actions we took, what could perhaps could be the intent of our activity, online activities specifically, right? Prior researchers have already uh, leveraged publicly available online data such as tweets and Facebooks, right? And they have done uh, and, and also demonstrated great strides that this kind of publicly available data could be used for addressing mental health issues. Uh, however, uh, building models uh, using uh, population level data and then trying to use it at an individual level has its own risk. Uh, Clearly, it violates some federal laws, and more importantly, machine learning models we know that can be noisy, uh, 
and most importantly uh, it, we could have a false positive uh, as a result uh, as an output from the machine learning model which could lead to waste of resources right and 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 it could we could the model can uh, give out uh, have false positive high false positives also which which it means like it's failing to identify those who need help the most so how mind is different and then others is is the type of data that we are leveraging in this work so uh, we are for, for the purpose of this work, we are focusing on Google search engine logs, YouTube history logs, Google Maps usage logs. All of these data as are at an individual level. Uh, and we aim to deploy uh, our tool in, in, a, in a setting such as outpatient clinic where doctors know patients. Patients are, patients are easy to follow up with, right? And getting consent from, from folks are easier. So this is just a demonstration of how uh, we collect data is uh, a user come in or a participant uh, to be specific come in when they keep their consent, they log in with their Gmail and then they take a series of mental health assessment questionnaire. Those are a ground truth. And then they are forwarded to uh, a Google takeout uh, platform where they select the type of data that they would be sharing with the research team the data is downloaded by Google and then and we have a system that anonymizes that data and then the data is put in a HIPAA compliant secure data storage following that data analysis and feature extraction all of those happens and that uh, and the result eventual result could be shared with the care provider as well as the patient also so to build all these models, uh, at least what we have in mind is some some form of temporal and contextual uh, features from the online engagements. So, so the idea is like you know the temporal features capture certain change in behavior, where the contextual uh, or the semantic features will capture what type of things that they are um, uh, exploring or watching or consuming. Uh, we are planning on. Uh, Online act as we all know that online activities are basically uh, events on the time axis. So we could really deploy, uh, sorry, employ a time series based analysis or point process based analysis for exploring the time uh, temporal features. And we could uh, we are planning on leveraging Google Cloud NLP API and the YouTube API to get more context around the the words that they search or the videos that they watch or even how much they have watched uh, and the video length of the video, so on and so forth. And once we have those features, our goal is to, you know, have supervised model trained and, and that can predict anxiety, and depression, identify individuals with self-harm ideation, so on and so forth. So this is just a demonstration of output of our, of our system, which is, uh, is like, you know, given any chunk of online data, it can output what would be the dep uh, depression scale. So imagine x-axis is the time and, um, and um, a therapist have access to a graph like this where the green line is today and, between, and the therapist doesn't have access to the patient uh, until next appointment. But because of mind, uh, which, which, output, which pulls in the user's or the patient's online data and kind of approximates some, some depression score, now the therapist can uh, really assess or at least have some sort of uh, idea about what the patient might be experiencing given the online behavior. So uh, this plot could be shared with uh, a mind it runs on the user side. So this could be easily shared with the patient itself. So it helps the patient to self-educate. And in a more clinical setting, um, it would help care providers to really uh, assess if some patient should be called in earlier than their uh, visits, next visit. And, and also these model outcomes could be used as, as kind of like a helping hand to initiate specific treatment steps. Perhaps someone came in for a depression problem and put to see that the the model outputs that the person had super uh, uh, alarmingly uh, low self-esteem, 
last week, right? So someone who is some some specific care provider who is more more uh, capable in handling the specific scenario can actually treat the patient. And more importantly, care providers can can initiate can pinpoint specific time time point in the past and really engage with the user in a more meaningful manner uh, so that it's more like uh, uh, pa doctors have a, a better way of connecting with the patient. So, so far we have built uh, predictive engines for identifying individuals with uh, low self-esteem or detecting people who have suicide ideation and, and even predicting level of anxiety. And our next future work is to uh, really test this system and uh, in specifically in settings such as HIV outpatient clinic and the mental health and wellness clinic at our university's medical school. So that would be it. Uh, thank you for listening in. Hello, I'm Benjamin Koshi. I will present the work for Majid Hamad, who is a master's student in the Office Institute for Information Technology in Oldenburg, Germany. So this work is focused on pulse transit time estimation for blood pressure measurement in patients implanted with a left ventricular assist device. The motivation for this work is to improve the quality of life and of care for people who have been implanted with such a device, so for this LVAD. Basically, if I might simplify, uh, an artificial art. And because it's people who are particularly at risk, and because the fact of being implanted with this device comes with its own set of problems, uh, their blood pressure needs to be monitored carefully. A lot of methods to measure their blood pressure doesn't work because they have uh, no pulse or very weak pulse. And because of that, we think we should investigate the use of pulse transit time estimation. That's not a new method, but it's new applied to people implied with an LVAD. So the LVAD model that we use is a so-called continuous flow LVAD, so it's basically a circular pump. And uh, in order to reduce the, the risk of pump thrombosis, so for example of blood clotting in the pump, uh, this pump has a so-called lavar cycle, meaning that every once per minute, the pump will for two seconds turn at a slower speed and then for one second at a higher speed. And those patients don't have a pulse, but we try to take advantage of the presence of this lavar cycle because this lavar cycle has an effect on the velocity of the pulse wave in their cardiovascular system and therefore on the PTT that we try to estimate. So using PTT for blood pressure, it makes sense only because we know that blood pressure and PTT are highly correlated. So in this work, we consider four of the more simple models for this relationship. So the linear inverse model, inverse square model, and logarithmic model. And those four models are nicely comparable because they all of them, the four of them, just rely on two parameters that can be relatively easily estimated if you have at least a small set of training data. And before working with realistic data, what we did is like just simulate some signals and using the model that is basically summarized in the plot that you see here. So on top, uh, you can see in blue and in orange, so in blue, uh, basic representation, representation of a pulse. So as a, here as a square wave and the lava signal, which, which can briefly reduce, reduce or increase the pressure. And uh, then if you would happen to have two pressure sensors placed uh, at a small distance from each other, you would, if your signals were very, very clean, uh, observe what is, in, what is in the middle plot with meaning that uh, in the second channel, the orange line is basically the same as the blue one, but delay and attenuated. 
But in a realistic system, you would have a lot of noise, for example, measuring noise from your sensors, and then you would have something much more noisy, as you can see in the bottom plot. And that's because of that, but yeah, measuring the delay is not as straightforward as one might think. We, for a moment, considered four methods, whole base and cross-correlation. So I think the first one is what we denote by TCC is the time domain cross-correlation. And uh, then, of course, you can apply it in the frequency domain, maybe among which advan one advantage is that it might be faster. And uh, yeah, for both of them, because we want to reduce the impact of noise, we can either apply a bandpass filter before computing the correlation, so that's the BPTCC, bandpass, time, bandpass filter on TCC, or you can just, if you are in the frequency domain, consider just some subbands, so the SBFCC. So that's detailed in the paper, but basically we applied that to a set of realistic data. And when I say realistic, it's measured with like a crude simulator of the cardiovascular system, as you can see on this, on this picture. So the LVAD and the two, pre the two uncalibrated pressure sensors that we use are part of a simulation of a cardiovascular system where we have water reservoirs to simulate like the heart and the lungs and a manometer that allows us to set what we want to be roughly the ground truth pressure. And we collected around four hours of signal and what we did is then considered the correlation between the PTT that we estimate and the true blood pressure in the system. And then you can see that out of the four considered models, they all perform similarly. It turns out that at the moment, the one between time domain and frequency domain correlation is very similar, but uh, frequency domain is faster. And applying a band pass on the frequency domain, meaning using only some subbands is beneficial. So that's, that's what we would use for, for our study. And so in conclusion, like we propose to use PTT to estimate blood pressure in people implemented with a NEVAD device. And for further work, which will focus on using a more realistic simulator and on a more long term, using, using it on data collected on real patient, uh, we would most likely use a combination of uh, frequency-based correlation based on only a few subbands. Thank you. Welcome everybody. My name is Nico Stickhan and I'm going to present for the Connected Healthcare Chair of Digital Health Center at Arthur Blattner Institute. I'm going to present instead of Citratul Montar, which is the first author, but she's not able to present herself, so I will be corresponding author. We have proposed a poster for self-prediction of seizures and drug-resistant epilepsy using digital phenotyping. And it's going to be a study concept we would like to share. Drug resistance is a prevalent condition in children and also adult patients with epilepsy. The quality of life of these patients is profoundly affected by the unpredictability of seizure occurrence. Some of these patients are capable of reporting self-prediction of their seizures by observing their effectivity. Some patients are not. Some report no signs or no feeling of any pre-monetary symptoms, prodromes or aura. Therefore, in this poster, we propose a concept study that will provide objective information to self or better self predict seizures for both the patient groups. Therefore, we would like to develop 
a model using digital phenotyping, which takes both um, ecological momentary assessment and data from wearable sensor technology into consideration. The method will be able to provide a feedback of their pre-monetary symptoms so that a preemptive therapy can be associated to reduce seizure frequency or even eliminate seizure occurrence. As you might know, epileptic triggers are various and can include stress, strobe lights and special emotions. Also gaming can trigger epileptic seizures. Unreliable predictability of seizures impact, of course, the quality of patient's life. Prediction of those premonitory symptoms can be used to pre perform a preemptive therapy. This could prevent from an upcoming seizures and thus increasing the quality of life of those patients. Our objective and our research questions are like this. Which effective states are useful for preceding seizures in the pre ictal and inter ictal phase? Second, if it is possible to identify prodromes and premonitory symptoms using physiological measures with machine learning techniques. Can patients use wearable devices to reduce the occurrence of seizures using our suggested system? And therefore, we designed a study that has the following flow. Again, we have two groups. One is capable of self-prediction and one is not capable of self-prediction. And we have a run-in phase of two weeks with smart devices and electronic diaries, a seizure lock, pre-monetary symptoms and items for the mood assessment. After this baseline assessment, people are being in the clinic and there they have the gold standard video EEG um, to assess their severity of epilepsy and also maybe to induce therapy. We would use this two weeks to run our models because we have there a more standardized setting but also as we have the baseline we would go, try to get off clinic data and predict also for, uh, when patients are at home. So the next and last phase is the validation of the system uh, using also our smart devices again and then introduce the feedback that is based on our previous classifier that we trained in the first phases of the study. The physiological data used in our experiment derives from variables like Empatica that is capable of recording heart rate variability by using the heart rate uh, using the electrodermal activity and also activity. And we also would have a mobile EEG um, because some of the symptoms cannot be captured quite easily. Um, but it's known that, of course, a neurological disease like epilepsy has to measure EEG also. And therefore, the video EEG as gold standard will be done in the hospital for two weeks, but of course not off clinic. Therefore, we would provide the nearest guy or EEG system, which is capable of running at home. We would also use classical diaries for medication adherence and like comorbidities, as we said, mental states, and also uh, quality of life and mood would be assessed using ecological momentary 
assessment, which is quite famous part in digital phenotyping, because you would need context-aware data in order to give feedback uh, in the wild later in the validation phase. But how we would do the tech is when we ca carry out the study and collect the data, there's a lot of pre-processing involved and filtering to get the feature extracted to train our classifier. Therefore, data from devices which are uh, Bluetooth devices and low energy that stream data directly using the sm patient's smartphone to our backup. The backup will also store the video EG data and also the uh, electronic diaries. After collecting the data, we need to filter for each um, data source independently. For example, the EG data will have a different pre-processing pipeline, of course, than working on the electrodermal activity or heart rate variability. The adaptive filtering is also part of our idea. It needs to be iterated and coupled with the machine learning classifier, so <coughs> pre-processing is already part of getting the correct features, getting uh, rid of artifacts like movement, uh, if you think of the assessment in the daily life. We would like to train classifiers to get an idea of depressive states, stress monitoring and anxiety. Also sleep could be one outcome here and also the EEG features of course. To do this, uh, you know, we might need to extract the time and frequency domain. And if we have kind of pre-modeled or the uh, machine learning model is also capable of in period uh, feature extraction and feature engineering, then we need to test a lot of different um, algorithms and try to assess which fits our needs, of course, which has good predictive performance, but also which is probably not uh, biased by any confounder. And we have always to keep the um, convenient in mind because patients would be at home and it has to run stable at home. And we need the context of those patients in order to give feedback about their preemptive states and hopefully we can later validate that the group that is uh, not able to predict by themselves really benefits and can kind of uh, come up to the level of patients that can predict seizures. It's known from a latest research that their uh, prediction uh, is said for a certain group quite impressive but still there are circumstances where also these uh, um, um, highly self-predictive uh, patients are not capable of doing it and especially if they are at good mood so we need to know what kind of emotions and affective states interfere with self-prediction and also are those groups that are capable in general of prediction but in some cases are not capable and then also use this information to uh, induce stress reduction techniques that are quite uh, supportive and a lot of patients uh, are like using also the alternative uh, therapies uh, alongside the medication intake. 
Hopefully we can improve quality of life. This is the main goal, the priority, having the passion and the focus uh, rather than uh, developing something uh, around the patient's needs. Thanks for listening. These are my colleagues and of course special thanks to our supervisors here from the Connected Healthcare Chair, Bert Arnrich, and also the Epileptology Department in Bonn, uh, led by Professor Surges, is really helpful to get access to the patients later and uh, be on board when designing this study. Thanks for listening. Have a good day. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Wei Jia Wang, the presenter of our poster, Streamlining the Prosthesis Fabrication Process Using 3D Technologies. This work is completed along with Chong Yan Chua and Tillman Dingler from the University of Melbourne. Our research focuses on patient care for those who lost limbs due to traumas, diseases, or conditions at birth. This group of patients often require artificial limb replacements, also known as prostheses. Usually, each prosthesis requires high customization to ensure it fits on the patient. The traditional prosthesis fabrication procedure, which is called plaster casting, has a lot of drawbacks. It doesn't allow clinicians to record digital copies of the limb stumps, so if there are any corrections to be made, Patients will need to visit the hospital for multiple times. Moreover, sculpting plaster also brings respiratory issues for prosthetic technicians. Therefore, we are actively seeking human-centered strategies to help clinicians to keep an eye on their patients, making sure there are as few complications as possible in patients' recovery processes. We also aim to bring convenience to clinicians using modern technologies. In recent years, computer-aided design and manufacturing technologies have demonstrated great potentials to be incorporated to improve the current prosthesis fabrication procedure. They include 3D scanning, modeling, and printing. 3D scanning is feasible for capturing residual limbs. A handheld scanner is a lightweight tool for clinicians to accurately obtain the geometry of patients' limb stumps and keep digital copies of them. That also allows consultations to happen at the patient's places, too. Moving the modeling tasks to a digital space avoids sculpting plaster, which eliminates health issues for technicians. That also allows us to create fitting sockets directly and prepare for further usage. Finally, 3D printing allows prosthetists to quickly obtain models of the patient's residual limbs without involving any human efforts in sculpting. The models printed can be used for forming sockets for the prosthesis. The result from our evaluation has demonstrated that the 3D printed limb molds can be straightly used for lamination process, during which a resin socket shell is formed around the residual limb mold. The shell itself persisted the shape and dimensions of the original limb after being measured. We also found that the models can be used for blister draping, where a piece of heated thermoplastic sheet is covered over the model to form a clear testing socket. The model sustains its structure when it is filled with plaster, and it is also easy to be broken down so that a clear testing socket can be obtained. Such 3D technologies can also assist the production of facial prosthesis. The conventional method involves wax sculpting, an experienced demanding procedure that produces flipped copies of facial features, such as ears. However, 
3D scanning and digital operations will replace empirical sculpting and make the procedure much easier. To wrap up, our study has demonstrated the feasibility of streamlining the prosthesis fabrication procedure using 3D technologies. The use of such technologies has a focus on people themselves and can be integrated into the current practices, bringing convenience to both of the clinicians and patients and adding values to both of the industry and the society. That's all for our presentation. Thank you. Hello, uh, I am Deva, a PhD student at Drexel University, and I'll be presenting our poster on Tamika for the Pervasive Health Conference, um, which is done in collaboration with researchers at Drexel University and Michigan State University. So, the we developed a conversational agent called Tamika, which is short for Tailorable Autonomous Motivational Interviewing Conversational Agent. So what Tamika does is Tamika helps parents to adopt healthy eating habits through the use of motivational interviewing techniques. We found that in terms of family eating, family healthy eating, parents play an important role in shaping their children's eating habits in the future. And many of and obesity is a major concern in America today. So by helping children adopt healthy eating habits from an earlier age, we can potentially help curb the spread of obesity obesity in such alarming rates. And here parents play an important role as they are the primary caregivers for the children and shape what they eat and their children's eating preferences in the future. A motivational interviewing technique is a proven effective counseling method that helps individuals to discover motivation and strategies for their personalized behavior change, meaning that it is a, therap it is a therapeutical method which helps individuals to come up with their own goals that is suitable for them in their personalized context. And this has been to be proven especially useful for diet modification. Hence, we make use of MI in a conversational agent to help parents eat healthy together with their children. There have been many technology adapted motivational interviewing approaches in the past which have shown to reduce therapist burden and extend the intervention beyond uh, an in-person interaction with a therapist and also cater to the undeserved, for example, the rural populations. But the problem with the current TAMIs are that they are limited in the tailoring to meet users' individual needs and preferences. Only 13 out of the 1958 studies on conversational agents discuss tailoring features. And if tailoring is discussed, it is limited to single users and does not go beyond an individual's needs. Especially for in our case, we want to see how parent-child diet could potentially affect tailoring of conversational agents. So we are designing and developing a privacy sensitive conversational agent that incorporates MI to help parents eat healthy together with the children. Privacy sensitive, I say, because we develop the prototype in-house and all the data is stored locally. It is different from Amazon and Alexa in that Tamika incorporates interpersonal interaction principles, which allow for conversational agents to adapt to users' needs and preferences as well as for explicit tailoring of conversational agents by users, such as them changing the gender, voice, accent, etc., of Tamika. So 
For the framework of Tamika, it includes th the three pillars of motivation, conversation, and tailoring. The motivation includes the clinical psychology side, which incorporates motivational interviewing principles. The conversation includes the machine learning and NLP sides, which automates the uh, whole MI process. And tailoring involves the human computer interaction side, which um, helps in tailoring the conversational agent according to the user's needs and preferences. In our case, it would be the needs and preferences of the parent child diet. So we developed an initial working prototype of Tamika, which uh, runs without an internet connection. Uh, so the components such as the display, the keyboard, and the Raspberry Pi are uh, what the researchers mainly use. And the components of microphone and speaker are what is shown to the participant for them to interact with Tamika. And all this has been developed locally and runs without an internet connection. So as to cater to affordability, because you do not require an internet connection and as well as to cater to the privacy of the user's data. Uh, this is an example interaction transcript of a user interacting with Tamika. As you can see, the text highlighted in green is when Tamika shows, uh, empathizes with the participant's concern and helps which is a form of an interact, interpersonal interaction principle. Then the text in orange is when uh, it re Tamika recognizes barriers to eating healthy, such as time and grocery shopping and cooking every day. And the text in blue is Tamika helping the participant to come up with their own goals for eating healthy instead of suggesting goals as it increases the autonomous motivation in participants to adhere to the goals that they come up with. So this is an example of how Tamika interacts with the participant. We also have uh, accompanying interfaces which allow for tailoring of Tamika as I talked about earlier. Uh, the interface on the left allows for real-time uh, feedback, feedback by the parents in that they can see what Tamika is saying to them during a session and like or dislike points in the session that they found were awkward or they especially liked. Um, on the right is the after session feedback screen, which allows for the participants to give detailed feedback on their interaction with Tamika, such as it, it misunderstood me or it was redundant or if there was a for positive feedback to give more detailed feedback on that. So these two interfaces allow for explicit tailoring of Tamika by the participants in this case would be the parents of children. So I just introduced the whole uh, concept behind Tamika and where we are with the team Tamika prototype and how Tamika works. Uh, the next steps would be to evaluate the feasibility and acceptability of Tamika and the tailoring interface prototypes through a user testing session, which will last one hour. Initially, we thought it to be in person or virtual, but due to COVID, it will all be virtual. Um, it includes a 20 minute MI session followed by an interview to investigate the design requirements of tailoring interface as per the parents' needs, as, as well as to understand the perception of Tamika by parents and how they see themselves using Tamika for themselves as well as the children in their everyday lives. So for this, we plan to recruit around 50 parents who have at least one child, are interested in eating healthier together with the child, reside in the US and have access to a camera enabled device and internet for to be able to chat via Zoom. And that was our next steps. As for this presentation, 
um, again, just to have a closing acknowledgement screen. Um, this work is supervised by my advisor, Dr. Gina Hoyu at Drexel. And there are other collaborators at Drexel and MSU who have collaborated to this project. This project has also been part funded by NSF grant. And um, thank you. In spring 2020, due to the coronavirus, we all had to stay at home in quarantine. When being at home for longer, some may want to use the time to acquire new athletic skills. Good thing that you can find a video about almost everything online. We may find a video of a Taekwondo professional and start to imitate his exercises. But soon we realize that we don't actually know how well we perform. Some kind of validation of our movements and comparison with those of the professional would be very helpful. This brings us to the objective of this contribution, Will You Be My Carentine, a computer vision and inertial sensor based home exercise system. We implemented a platform where movements recorded with an RGB camera or a depth camera can be compared with the movements of a beginner using inertial measurement units. This way, the user gets a validation of her own performance and knows how well she performed compared to the movements of her professional. Therefore, our overall system works in two directions. On the one hand, pose information was extracted from a video of an expert and then these poses were used to predict 3-axis acceleration data. On the other hand, 3D trajectories were estimated based on data from inertial measurement units using sensor fusion. These multiple IMU sensors could be worn by an athlete at home to learn a new movement. In order to generate acceleration data for each of the sensors, a recurrent convolutional neural network was used. The architecture was inspired by the paper Let There Be IMU Data by Ray and others. This paper already managed to predict the acceleration magnitude from 2D poses. But for making the network usable for exercise improvement, 3D acceleration data needs to be predicted. Let's now look into how the network achieves this in detail. Here in orange, you can see joint blocks. They use 1D convolutional layers to learn a correlation of poses over time. Important to note is that this happens for each joint individually. Hereby, the network learns how a movement of a joint looks like. Having this movement information for each of the individual joints allows the next layers to draw conclusions about multiple joints. Now the following dense layer is able to correlate these encoding joint movements to form whole body movements. Yet the blue part of the network is a simple time distributed dense layer. This is a great point for further research to find a way of better modeling the complex interaction of joints. The sensor blocks now have the task of transforming the whole body movement into acceleration data, like the one recorded by an inertial measurement unit. Again, this is done with one block per sensor. This is the resulting prediction of the three axis acceleration data using the trained neural network and the 2D poses from the video as input data. With these generated data from the video, the actual measured IMU data of the athlete can be compared. In the second part, we estimate the 3D trajectories of the inertial measurement units with the acceleration and gyroscope data using sensor fusion. Since an IMU sensor cannot determine its absolute position and orientation, but only its acceleration and angular velocity, these values have to be integrated once, respectively twice, over time in order to obtain trajectories. Because numerical integration of noisy and biased data, such as IMU data, leads to growing errors after only a short period of time, this integration has to be corrected periodically. We have built our algorithm upon the work of Tunka and others, which used an error state Kalman filter for error correction. 
Let's see how we have these techniques combined into an application. The Here Develop dashboard provides insights into the collected data and its characteristics. In the middle, the dashboard visualizes the trajectories from the poses in the video and the estimated trajectories from the IMU sensors. By selecting a different view, the dashboard also displays the actual measured and predicted IMU data. Advanced key performance indicators and derived metrics are displayed on the left and right side. In total, this allows the user to gain multiple different insights into the characteristics of their moves and hopefully allows them to improve their quarantine workouts even more. Thank you.